Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm very excited to be presenting here today at the Parents and Caregivers as Partners Conference. Uh, and today's session with me is going to be all around the new Ontario science and technology curriculum. And we're going to be looking specifically at how you might engage uh, your, your student that you have at home uh, in STEM-based learning uh, using a few of the key resources uh, available uh, free and online. But before we begin, let's do our acknowledgement of the traditional lands. I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is situated upon traditional territories. These territories include the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and Métis Nation. I would also like to recognize the enduring presence of all Aboriginal peoples on this land. So as we look at the new curriculum, uh, which launched uh, officially this September, uh, we're gonna notice that there are a few key new areas, a number of new areas, but also many things that have remained and, and have changed. So while all the topics from 2007 are still included with the launch of the new curriculum in 2022, uh, a few key changes have been made, including a reduction uh, to the total number of specific expectations, uh, <clears throat> as well as the addition of a strand A. While the strand is new, many of the key skills with regard to developing STEM and research and experimentation skills were included in the previous curriculum, but have been purposefully redesigned to help students integrate science and technology in all areas of their life. So this new strand is not taught uh, in a particular sequence, but rather it is organized to promote the development of a broad range of skills and perspectives that include uh, STEM skills and connections, uh, engaging students with the engineering design process, a focus on hands-on experiential learning, inclusion, uh, specific inclusion and explicit language to include indigenous knowledge and perspective, uh, looking at contributions to science and technology um, and specifically thinking about uh, voices within the, the science space that uh, historically have been left out and making sure to include diverse lived experiences uh, from various communities. We also see the addition of coding in strand A. Uh, and uh, from a science perspective, this might be, um, we might see our students learning how to model concepts, um, you know, starting to show their understanding of, of uh, technological problems uh, and uh, framing it all uh, within the impact that coding has uh, as an emerging technology. Uh, another area included in the new curriculum is food literacy. Uh, so there we look at food systems, um, the sort of connection to physical and mental health as it relates to food, uh, and the role uh, the environment plays in how our food is grown um, and the significance of locally sourced food. And another area that's been added to Strand A is uh, climate change. And while there were strong environmental components to the 2000, 2007 curriculum, uh, climate change has now been um, included more explicitly. Uh, and we're trying to get students to uh, use their critical thinking uh, to uh, better understand the, the kinds of environmental issues that are affecting all life on earth. Um, and with the, with the idea that uh, we wanna start to frame our learning in science and, and technology um, from, from the lens of solving problems. Uh, so today's, in today's presentation, uh, we're gonna focus on some practical resources that can be tried at home uh, to help support students. Uh, and today we're gonna look at grades one, four, and eight across the four topic areas. So in grade one, we're gonna look at uh, life systems, the needs and characteristics of living things. Uh, for matter and energy, we're gonna look at uh, energy in our lives. And for structures and mechanisms, we're going to look at everyday materials, objects, and structures. Uh, 
And for Earth and space systems, we'll be looking at daily and seasonal changes. For our grade four selection today, we'll be looking at habitats and communities under life systems. Under matter and energy, we'll be looking at light and sound. Under structures and mechanisms, we'll consider machines and their mechanisms. And under earth and space systems, we'll look at rocks, minerals, and geological processes. And our last set of resources, under life systems, we'll look at uh, grade eight cells. Uh, for matter and energy, we'll look at fluids. Under structures and mechanisms, we'll look at systems in action. And finally, uh, our last grade eight area we'll look at under earth and space systems, we will look at water systems. So as we navigate the four main topic areas in grades one, four, and eight, we'll consider uh, three different uh, but impactful curriculum resources from TVO Learn, the Ontario Science Centre, as well as Science North. Each of these sites has been thoroughly designed to promote scientific thinking and inquiry at home. Um, let's go take a look at each of the landing pages for these resources so you know how to access them. So for TVO Learn, you can find the landing page just by going to Google or, or any browser search engine and just typing in TVO Learn. It should be the first link that comes up for you. <clears throat> for the elementary curriculum resources, we're going to go to elementary K to eight. But if you're here uh, in a secondary context today, by any chance, there's also great secondary resources as well. I can click on this drop down menu to select a grade, or I can also scroll down and get a grade representation down here. So if I chose grade one, this will take me to all the different uh, subject areas available to explore, uh, and I would choose science and technology. And then when I scroll down, I will see all the specific science and technology resources available on this site uh, specific to grade one. But one thing to notice, uh, they've got some different uh, categories we can focus on here. And these are all um, you know, great resources within, within each. But for today's focus, we're going to be considering uh, Ontario because uh, we're looking at the, the new Ontario curriculum. For our second resource, we're going to be looking at the science at home from the Science Center. And this was developed uh, over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and the, while maybe not um, as many resources uh, aligned with the, the new curriculum available across the grades, there's still some great stuff in here. Um, and so if we scroll down a bit off this main page and we go down to science at home curriculum resources, we'll be able to search by grade from here. And scroll down a little more and you'll see a list of all the different grades that have at least one but often more resources available all of the resources in in this site uh, are re very focused on things you can do at home uh, the materials are uh, uh, i'm not going to say common but um, e very easy to for uh, to source and um, uh, and uh, and, and come in at a very reasonable price, often things that you can find in and around uh, uh, your, your home. And the third one we're going to look at is Science North. And this uh, is like the Science Center in Toronto, but it's uh, up in Sudbury. Uh, and they also, over the course of the pandemic, uh, designed a number of curriculum resources um, organized by grade. Now, these ones were a little more geared towards uh, teachers teaching from home, um, but I find them to be very accessible uh, overall uh, and uh, often include excellent media files, uh, explainer videos uh, to, to help students uh, make sense and make meaning from some of, some of the work they're doing in the science curriculum. So we'll get back to that in a minute. But before we do that, I want to start with uh, a little bit, uh, build our understanding a little bit of, uh, around strand A. And uh, earlier I had mentioned uh, a wide range of new material uh, that was going to show up in strand A. One I wanted to focus on in particular uh, uh, sh that shows up in strand A is the engineering design process. And for, for those of you that are not familiar with how this works, I'm going to take you through a bit of the curriculum and um, the way that they're framing this 
as um, really a, a system that students can engage with uh, and use to help um, better understand a problem uh, and design solutions uh, around that problem. So let's dive in a little bit. I'm using a tool called Mindomo, by the way, uh, which is a mind mapping software uh, and is available to uh, all students in the TDSB and uh, they can use their uh, existing sign-in uh, that they would have um, available to them through the school system uh, to sign into this account as well. I'm just gonna minimize this uh, image for a second here. So uh, it does allow me to uh, create mind maps, as I said, um, but once a mind map is created, you can also go into presenter view and that's what we're gonna do right now. So when we think about the engineering design process, it's really a circular framework. And at the, at the center of it all uh, is the question that a student is trying to answer or another way to think of it is the problem that they're trying to solve. And so once they've defined their problem or, or, or they have their question, uh, one of the uh, earlier or first steps you might do is uh, research uh, research the problem and try to understand it better. And so from the perspective of the new curriculum, uh, that's asking students to do uh, primary research uh, at, at the start. So you know, looking at different print and online resources to try and gain a better understanding of the problem or the subject area that they're trying to solve a problem within. Uh, and then it also highly encourages um, uh, sorry, pardon me, the, that was secondary research. And they also highly encourage primary research. And this is the idea that uh, we're going to start to think about um, who is affected by the problem and do we have any access to those people so that we might be able to interview them and find out um, from an, an empathetic point of view, the way that they see the problem uh, so that when we start to build and design solutions uh, for that problem, uh, it's, uh, it is already connected um, to the people most affected by that problem. The next phase in the engineering design process is something called ideation or ideate and generate potential solutions. So this is, um, you know, this might look like for a student uh, starting to brainstorm, thinking about what a solution might look like or multiple solutions might look like. Um, and so, you know, if I'm if if I'm trying to come up with uh, a very specific solution to a problem, I want to make sure I have more than one idea um, uh, in this process, and uh, so that I'm I'm thinking widely about you know different ways to solve a single problem. Once we have a selection of problems, uh, a selection of of possible solutions to the problem, now it's time to select. Uh, one of them and develop what's called a prototype. Uh, so in that development phase, that might be, you know, a, a kind of a physical object that the student is building and they're going to test it out to see how well it solves the problem. Uh, if it's more on the digital side, that might be um, a solution that they've used coding for uh, to, to program a solution to the problem uh, in, in that way. Um, there's no one way to develop a prototype, uh, but so those are just a couple of examples. Once a student has developed their prototype, it's very important that whatever they developed uh, can authentically be tested. Um, this is a really important phase of the engineering design process because we want to make sure that the solutions we've designed uh, to solve these problems actually work. And if they don't work, we want to figure out why they don't work. And once we've tested our solutions, we're going to evaluate those tests. We're going to analyze, well, okay, so we, we have a solution, uh, we had an idea, we built a prototype, and now we're, we've tested that prototype. Um, how well did it work? And is there any uh, revisions to that prototype that need to be put in place, um, you know, in that testing? We Have we communicated to the audience in any way, which is really the next step, but um, have we got some feedback from the people most affected by the problem uh, to see how well it solves that problem? And this last phase is communicating the solution. And that can look like a lot of different things. If, if it's a 
you know, a typical product design cycle. Um, that might mean uh, we're figuring out um, how to put the idea out into the world. Uh, that might be going back uh, to the communities we interviewed um, and presenting the problem uh, back to those communities. Lots of different ways we can think about communicating the problem. Sorry, communicating the solution, pardon me. So now we're going to dive a bit more into uh, some of the specific curriculum expectations. And we're going to start with uh, understanding life systems in grade one. And within the context of the new curriculum, we, you know, it is strongly encouraging students to make connections and explore uh, elements of their natural environment, um, regardless of whether that's a, a more rural or urban setting, uh, trying to get students to get out into the world um, and and you know make meaning from from those spaces um starting to get them to think about uh, you know what are the differences between living and non-living things uh, and how those things exist together um and another important facet is is understanding the basic needs of living things such as air water and nutritious food um to to try and um uh bring all that learning together so this first resource uh, is from TVO Learn, uh, and it's an activity where students will explore different species of birds uh, as a way to um, build, a, build a bird feeder. So let's go check it out. So I'm going to scroll down a bit. So all of the TVO Learn uh, activities start with a minds on, and that's a bit of a teacher term. But all that really means is we're gonna we're gonna get students thinking uh, about the topic. Um, if there's any uh, teachers who happen to be listening to this today, you might you might be interested in going over to the learning goals because uh, they're nicely laid out, uh, and as well success criteria uh, has been laid out um, in in sort of uh, student friendly language. Uh, so that's also available for you as well. So I'm going to flip back to the Minds On. So down here, uh, there's some nice visuals, getting students to look at uh, different species of, in this case, birds, making observations, uh, perhaps, about uh, their natural environment. But when we get to the action, uh, it starts to um, present some some different ideas that we can that your students at home can explore. Um, some of these uh, resources uh, have actual activities that can be done right at the screen level. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're looking uh, for um, different different types of things uh, that uh, that that birds eat, uh, and then going through some activities to try and match those ideas. Uh, to, to two boxes, either birds eat it or they do not eat it. Uh, and then as we get down further, um, there is a, a nice activity that's going to get students um, thinking about how they might design, build, and test uh, their own um, uh, idea for a birdhouse. And so that's, that's not an example of where we might uh, engage in the engineering design process that we spoke about in an earlier slide uh, and, you know, have students, you know, in this case, maybe pick a specific species of bird, um, find out some ideas or, around that bird, what they what they eat, where they live, what kind of um, birdhouse would be most attractive to them. And then you might even take it further uh, and start thinking about, well, you know, who who else might be interested in that bird food and how could um, and how could we prevent those um, other species or maybe a predator that threatens that bird from also accessing that same food or having access to those birds. I'm going to flip to the next one. So we're going to move ahead now. So we're in the same uh, topic area. Uh, so we're still in understanding life systems, but now we've gone from grade one to grade four. So skip ahead a few years, uh, and now uh, we'll look at this, uh, this resource from Science North. And this one uh, in particular, so you notice the Science North, um, regardless of which grade you're in, they'll tell you which of the main topic areas you're in at the top here. So this is matter and energy. We want to go down to life systems. So I'm going to scroll down a bit. 
So here we see life systems. So that's another grade four lesson you might uh, consider um, doing with your students at home. Um, but the one we're gonna focus on today is around soil acidity. And I'll just play a little bit of this video. They all take the same sort of format. You'll get an introduction. So I'll stop there for a second. So when we think about uh, this particular curriculum areas, life systems, habitats, and communities, um, you know, the curriculum's asking students to explore various local habitats. In this case, this is, you know, it's not gonna be local for our TDSB students, but it's kind of neat to get a different perspective. Sudbury is obviously a mining community and um, much um, much effort has uh, happened in that region um, it, with regard to you know digging up um, various uh, uh, parts of that environment up there, and that you know this resource is talking about you know some of the human impacts that those kind of explorations have had. Uh, so that's an interesting context to for for our students to explore. Um, curriculum specifically looks at. Uh, you know, how, how those kinds of impacts might, um, or, or what kind of impacts those kinds of actions might have on different organi organisms um, interacting within them. And in this particular looking, in this particular example, looking at uh, the impact of, of um, soil acidity and, and, how, and how that uh, can impact the overall health of the soil in, in, uh, in that particular region. Uh, there's a nice hands-on element to this as well. Uh, if you take notice, the materials involved um, are fairly accessible uh, and um, we'll, we'll take students uh, into more of an experimentation mindset as they make their way through this activity. Uh, notice to see if I can get it. Go. There we go. So those little yellow dots there just indicate some key areas um, where you might want to uh, forward to in, in terms of uh, hitting on the curriculum content. Um, there's some resources here which can be downloaded, uh, but overall the Science North activities are, are very fun and accessible. I'm going to flip back now. So the last one we're going to look at for understanding life systems is a grade eight uh, resource. Um, at this in this curriculum area, uh, there's a there's a few things that are important to understand. Uh, the main focus is looking at cells as the basic unit of life, and students will uh, through their investigations look at simple cell processes uh, and uh, consider the impact of emerging technologies uh, in the field of cell biology and sort of uh, try to contextualize um, you know the impacts that those emerging technologies have on on society and the environment at large uh, so this is a resource from the ontario science center uh, and this particular activity is getting students to perform an experiment to investigate how diffusion and osmosis works so i'm just going to pop over here And again, similar to Science North, the resources on the Ontario Science Center um, have a, a video to anchor the conversation. So you can see that uh, it gives a great backgrounder 
it's, you know, and again, it's it's very informal. So you know, students are are hopefully not going to be intimidated uh, by these resources as they're you know they're kind of set up um, in in a home environment, uh, and that's kind of the beauty of them. Um, also great though, uh, is there's usually a series of lessons plans, uh, slides if you want, I, I think those are more for the teachers, uh, and usually a, a number of downloadable PDFs that kind of capture the whole lesson um, in one place. So those are all there for you as well. And I tend to like the uh, PDFs the most because they're sort of visualized and, um, and quite easy to, to make meaning from. Uh, similar to Science North, they often uh, uh, provide an area where students can um, record their observations in the experiments that they're doing uh, and start to build that um, understanding of, you know, what, what doing good science uh, can look like. Of course, anything where we're dealing with any kind of food, we always want to make sure uh, that we have our safety lens on and we're thinking about uh, allergies or, or any other aggravants that, that might uh, require an alternative to be used. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on now. So that that covers our uh, resources for the understanding life systems section, and uh, we're going to move over to matter and energy. And now we're flipping back down to grade one. Uh, so when we think of grade one, matter and energy, this this particular topic area is focused on energy in our lives. Uh, and so here, students um, start to think about um, the, I guess the the importance of the of energy in their lives, such as you know, how, how does energy move and change and, um, and how, how can energy be used to support um, life in the natural world? Um, how can it be thought of as a source that keeps our, our uh, homes warm? Um, and, you know, we learn about um, how the sun works and how it warms the air and the land uh, and the water and um, how it provides uh, light and as a source of energy for earth. Um, so in this activity, we're, we're going back to Science North and we're gonna learn uh, about different forms of energy by building uh, a fun, simple catapult. And I think this is a great one um, for doing at home. Again, oops, the link was wrong there. Let me just double check that. Pause the recording for a second. Okay, I think we have the link fixed now. So again, this uh, this particular resource um, is called Energy, Where Does It Go? And it's on the Science North website. And we'll scroll down. Here we go. And in this lesson plan, again, students are gonna learn um, about different types of energy through the uh, experience of building. Uh, you can do up to three uh, mini projects here. Uh, so we have building catapult using plastic spoon and cotton balls, um, a second version that gets a little more elaborate, uh, and then a third one, which ventures into building a air, uh, paper airplane launcher. And again, all these materials, um, uh, quite quite easily to uh, quite easy to access um, and um, and very low cost. Again, we have an anchoring video here. and how we can transform it. <laughs> Later on in my presentation, I'm gonna invite you to do an activity with me. You're gonna need a couple of materials to do so. Go get them now. So, you know, obviously you have to already have these materials handy, um, but uh, it takes you right through the whole process. Skip down a little bit to get to more of the hands-on zone. 
over here. So this, you know, just, just literally using your hands um, to learn about how a catapult works. Uh, and then the builds get um, a little more detailed as they go on. On the top, so there we go. So it's kind of a great launching pad. Now remember, I'm gonna place my finger here just to kind of stabilize my catapult. I'm going to take my cotton ball and I'm going to place it in my little house there. Now again, I'm creating a little bit of tension. So now my cotton ball has the potential to move if I let go. So notice too how they're integrating some of the vocabulary vocabulary that would be important for students um, to start building uh, across across the matter and energy uh, topic area. Uh, and so that's integrated uh, right into the video. So I'm going to leave that one there for now. And we'll go back to our presentation. And now we're heading into grade four, matter and energy, light and sound. Uh, and here, um, students are um, going to investigate, you know, diff different ways that light and sound uh, can be understood, uh, in particular, focusing on um, the vibrations uh, or, or learning about vibrations as, as the cause of sound waves um, and looking how, you know, different materials interact with light and sound and energy. Um, in this case, um, we're going to pop over to uh, back back over to the Ontario Science Center. And this is a really cool one uh, on echolocation. Um, and I'll skip watching the video for now, but we can check out this uh, PDF. Pardon me, I actually wanted the other one. There we go. Uh, and this is cool too. So um, this is, uh, looking at uh, uh, echolocation and, and how that's used in the context of uh, uh, species of bats um, and um, is, is another kind of hands-on uh, sound experiment students can do to, to better understand um, how echolocation works. In the case of this one, um, the, a student will um, just fashion some sort of blindfold uh, and uh, learn to experience uh, sound without seeing and uh, start to build an understanding of echolocation through uh, a very simple uh, experiment that can be done at home. And uh, the last understanding matter and energy we're going to look at is for grade eight. Uh, and so, you know, we've gone from grade one, grade four, grade eight in, in each of these examples. And so hopefully um, there's a there's a little bit of a continuity in your mind starting to build. Um, but this one, um, this one gets a, a, a quite, uh, quite detailed as we start to explore uh, some of the properties and uses of fluids. Um, we look at buoyancy uh, of an object, um, you know, and how, how that, uh, and think, start to think about how that same object um, uh, reacts in, in, a, in a variety of fluids. Um, and we also could look at the flow of fluids and, uh, you know, viscosity and things like that. Um, as well in the same uh, unit, uh, grade eights also consider pneumatic and hydraulic devices uh, and systems. Uh, and that's a really fun uh, area. Um, so you might see in your grade eight students' classrooms, um, the use of uh, sort of uh, uh, syringes without any needles, obviously, uh, syringes attached to tubes uh, and looking at how um, we can uh, use, uh, whether they're filled with uh, a, a liquid or filled with air Air, use that um, use those syringes to make uh, mechanical devices move. So in this case, we're going to look uh, at the TVO Learn, uh, and uh, students are going to explore fluids through uh, an environmental lens and consider the impact of oil spills uh, and test a range of possible solutions. The organization of this activity is going to be very similar to the other one we looked at. Uh, again, we're going to have uh, the minds on. Um, available to us. Again, if you're a teacher coming to this, um, you might look at the learning goals. And the Minds On is really just um, getting students thinking about what they might already know about uh, an, a, a particular subject. Uh, there's an activity as well here you can do. Uh, and in the action section, 
it's going to offer uh, a number of different ways to think about this topic uh, and, and usually a, a hands-on um, activity as well. And we get down to the second task, we start thinking about what it would look like or to, to clean up an oil spill and all the work that's involved with that and getting an, a sense. Um, I think when you start to look at this particular topic area, uh, your students really start to get a sense of just how impactful an oil spill can be onto a natural environment and all the uh, plant life and, and uh, animal species impacted by those uh, oil spills. Um, here, um, I, after considering a solution, uh, or a method to clean up an oil spill, they start to have to consider what are the pros and cons of each solution. So again, some of that engineering design thinking coming in here as well as we evaluate a solution. Here we get into some experimentation and testing. Uh, and it also includes activity sheets that they can use. Uh, so again, another, um, another um, solid resource that can be done at home. Uh, and um, help to build that student's understanding and uh, not, not only of this particular subject area, but also um, starting to build that environmental lens into their thinking in a science and technology curriculum. Moving over now to understanding structures and mechanisms at the grade one level. So this is really a student's, um, you know, outside of kindergarten, this is gonna be their first exposure to um, kind of building uh, building structures um, with in, in, a, in a purposeful way. Um, and so, you know, we might consider, you know, how, how some of the different qualities of a structure, their texture, their height, their shape, uh, their materials, um, how they were constructed, uh, and through the lens of an everyday object, you know, so, you know, considering the, the environment that's around them, um, you know, their clothing, their toys, their pencils, their paper, their crayons, um, but also structures you might find find out uh, in, in the world that they live in, you know, bridges and uh, houses and uh, apartment buildings and skyscrapers and streetlights. Uh, and so this Science North activity uh, is, is a scavenger hunt um, where students were going to go out into their, uh, their local surroundings. Just scroll down a bit. And again, we have the anchor video. This time I'm going to show um, maybe one of the, the handouts that would go with it rather than go through the video. Uh, and again, these are just, um, just uh, getting students to consider the world around them. Uh, describe them, build that observational language. Uh, so object one looks like this, object one is made out of, object two looks like this, object two is made out of. And again, if the language um, is difficult to access, um, you know, you, it'd be a good ac opportunity to read with your kids. But of course, you know, there's, there's no expectation. This is a drawing activity. So, um, this is, you know, students drawing the natural, drawing the world around them as it relates to this study of um, structures and mechanisms. Moving ahead to grade four, uh, we now consider machines and their mechanisms. And so here we're gonna look at some of the, the functions of machines and how they work uh, and think about their impact on the world and the environment. Um, and, you know, thinking about int the introduction of, of motion and, and how, how uh, machines are able to move and what powers them what, and what forces are used to power them. Um, uh, and you, you might see you know, the inclusion of uh, you know like pulleys and gears and how those work, or you might um, look at a um, uh, a machine, or you might look at, at an instrument and and consider how it works. So what are its moving parts? What allows the sound to be created? Uh, so this is a TVO learning learn activity. Um, where uh, they can explore a range of machines and mechanisms. Uh, and uh, there is a hands-on activity as well where students can uh, build their own uh, levers using uh, simple materials. So let's just pop on over there. So again, we have that minds on, learning goals down here, 
Okay, so the mind's on uh, often a video or, or at least a visual getting students thinking. Here we're going to look at uh, the machines focused on in each image. Um, and in this context, we're thinking about how that machine uh, is going to make someone's life easier. And that's neat too, because really now we start to think about, um, you know, when, when we think about designing solutions, um, that's an interesting context to have students design from, uh, thinking about how the things that they build and that they make um, inherently can improve someone's life. Um, go over to the action section now, start to see some more complex machines. Uh, and then a link back to some of the TVO series, um, finding stuff out with Zoe. It's cool because there's some episodes there that are uh, relevant to the curriculum. Uh, so that, that might be a fun, um, a fun activity as well to watch that. Uh, we start to get more specific into some of the, the language around levers. So we learn about load, effort, and what a fulcrum, the role of a fulcrum is. Uh, and then it, it becomes a design and build project from there. Um, this one in particular is pretty straightforward. Um, tells you the materials you need and steps it out one by one what you need to do. Uh, in this case, um, it's just uh, uh, a very simple lever made out of paper. Um, but again, if you have different materials or you wanna change the idea, uh, have your students um, uh, take it further, always an opportunity there but um, at its in its simplest form this is a great uh, a starting point for that that conversation around machines uh, I haven't really gone into it but notice too in the consolidation uh, area it's great because it's going to take everything that's been learned um, in the minds on and the action and kind of just bring it all into one uh, singular focus just to make sure uh, that all the main ideas are reiterated and uh, to, to try and solidify some of that learning. Okay. We're actually going to stick with um, TVO Learn for the next one. And this is uh, still understanding structures and mechanisms. But now we're going over to grade eight and considering mechanical systems um, and you know some of the factors that um, consider that need to be considered uh, in terms of their operation and the safety of their operations, um, and we might get into some you know uh, more analytical ideas around mechanical advantage and and some of the reasons we we have machines in the first place is to um, make life easier and that might practically you know if we if we think about you know, like go back to grade four, think about what pulleys do. Well, they, you know, if, if, if enough pulleys are chained together, they can make a heavy load feel light. And so that's an example of mechanical advantage. Uh, in this particular activity, um, again, an, another environmental lens kind of coming into the conversation uh, when students learn about vertical farming uh, and start to build their knowledge of coding in this example in order to build a simple application using a free piece of online uh, software called Scratch uh, as they explore and investigate water systems. So if you're new to the idea of vertical farming, um, well, again, I guess we start here with the minds on sort of understanding, you know, what traditional farming might look like. Um, and, uh, but as we go over to the action section, um, we start to consider, uh, you know, what would be sort of the benefits of, um, of growing uh, crops vertically and, and why would we do that, particularly in an urban environment, what's the relevance of vertical farming or indoor farming um, in, um, in, in the particular, you know, um, world we live in right now. Uh, we learn a bit about uh, hydroponics. And all the sort of uh, different, um, I guess, factors uh, that go into considering the success of uh, a vertical farm. Again, there's lots of, there's plenty of videos uh, speppered throughout this resource. Uh, we learn about inputs and outputs and processing. This is where we start to build some of that um, coding language, though that was that was present in the curriculum before we had uh, coding there, but there's a nice uh, through line or connection there. And as we get down further, we start to see some of this um, kind of programmatic thinking come into play. Uh, and then uh, there's a tutorial um, 
that actually will teach kids, uh, students, pardon me, um, about some of the different aspects of uh, the program Scratch and how we can use Scratch and coding, uh, in this case, to um, build a kind of simulator, if you will. Um, and it gives you the code to play with. So if you've never coded before, it'll give you a description of what that code is doing and how each block works. And then by the end, uh, they can build their own uh, version of it in Scratch. I think it's right here. And this will take them uh, directly over to Scratch and they can see a version of the product, of, sorry, pardon me, of the project. And here they can uh, try different moisture levels. Let's press play. Let's see if we can get this going. There we go. So kind of a cool simulator that um, students can, can build and uh, an interesting way to, um, you know, learn about, learn about water systems, uh, uh, but also engage in that strand A uh, specifically coding. Okay, so we're going now to our last section or our last set of topics, um, going back down to grade one, thinking about earth and space systems, daily and seasonal change. Uh, and in this uh, unit of study, students would uh, consider the cycle of seasons and um, look at the earth's rotation and its orbit around, orbit around the sun. Um, and uh, also look at, you know, kind of, you know, solidifying their learning on um, how the seasons uh, affect all living things on Earth, uh, things like animals uh, hibernating, um, uh, the changing of leaves colors and uh, the buds growing on trees and, and sap flowing uh, in the spring and why that happens at the in a particular time of the year. Um, and so in this activity, we're going to pop over to uh, Science North. And we're going to go down to not this one, part of me, this one here, freeze and thaw. And so here we're going to simulate seasonal change. And this is a hands-on activity that looks at uh, freezing and thawing chocolate chips. Now you could probably, if you didn't have uh, chocolate chips around, um, I'm sure there's other, other, um, other things you could use um, that could More chocolate for our activity create a similar um, adding some chocolate a similar effect in our microwave safe bowl i only needed about half a cup of chocolate chips we want to melt our chocolate chips using the microwave but chocolate can burn quite easily so we only want to put them in the, um, the microwave for about 30 seconds at a time Make sure to stir the chocolate chips every 30 seconds. Set aside to cool. Like me, you can use a regular balloon for this, but a water balloon will be less likely to break. Fill your balloon partway with water. Be careful not to overfill and burst the balloon. Be very careful when tying your balloon up. This is not easy, so ask an adult if you need help and make sure to tie it over the sink to avoid making a water mess. The chocolate should now be cool enough to touch, but still semi-liquid. Dip the balloon into the semi-molten chocolate and roll it around to get it a good coat on it. You may want to also put, uh, try to pour some of the chocolate. So, you know, if you're doing this at home uh, with students at home, um, you know, you might want to pause the video at different points. You might want to, um, you know, try to collect their observations and all those types of downloads are there if you want to use the sheets there, but it could just be on a, on a scrap of paper that you have around and you're getting students to really um, observe a phenomenon and make a prediction, um, test it out see what happens and then analyze their results. And regardless of whether that's a grade one or grade eight, 
um, and you know you might have to adjust the language um, based on on the student's age. Uh, the The concept is really similar across uh, across the grade bands. Chocolate on top using your spoon or spatula. You can experiment with the thickness of the chocolate coating. Beware, this part can be quite messy. Once done. So I'm going to leave that one there, but that's a really fun one. Um, and, and the results are interesting to see too and, um, and, and sort of uh, help to, to highlight some of the, um, in, in a practical way, what, what seasonal change can look like. Moving over to grade four, we're going to consider this time earth and space systems, and we're going to be looking at rocks and minerals and geological processes. Um, so we're looking at the formation of different types of rocks um, and trying to deepen the understanding of, of uh, rocks and minerals by getting students to learn how to classify them um, in different ways. Uh, and, and I guess equally important, we're, we're trying to get students to think about um, the role that rocks and minerals play in our everyday lives, because it's easy to kind of not really consider that. Um, but, you know, so many of the, um, you know, objects and devices that we, that we, uh, that we're so familiar with in the age we live in um, are, you know, often mined um, in, in one form or another. And so, uh, uh, you know, rocks and minerals play, uh, a, a very crucial role in, in the in the objects we enjoy in our everyday life. Uh, for this one, we're going to go check out TVO Learn again, and we're by now probably pretty familiar with the the three different top tabs that are always here. And of course, our learning goals are there, so we've got our minds on again, um, uh, looking at um, you know some of the uh, different. Uh, uh, types of, of rocks, rocks, minerals, metals that are mined in the world and um, how that uh, supplies us with uh, the raw material uh, that can be processed to uh, make everyday objects and like, a, like a toothbrush, uh, but also um, you know, the, the inner core of all the devices we use, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Interesting one as well. So talking about graphite, it's use in pencils, batteries. Uh, and even in Greece. So really getting kids to, to think about um, the role that rocks and minerals play in their everyday lives. Then we get to uh, the action part. Again, we're getting into a bit of a mining simulation activity. Always, and all of these, if there's any uh, safety issues to consider, that's always uh, up front before uh, you get down to um, the activity. And this is another one involving chocolate chips. Um, this is a fun one, really straightforward. Uh, basically, if if you know if you can get a, a bag of some kind of cookie, um, uh, preferably with chocolate chips, doesn't have to be chocolate chips. Anything where a student could try and uh, using a toothpick um, try to mine out. Um, the chocolate chips from the cookie part. Uh, and, you know, no matter how you try and do this activity, it's, it's always challenging to get um, a chocolate chip cleanly broken away using a toothpick from, from its original cookie. So you can start to look at the impacts, uh, you know, kind of like a, an analogy, if you will. Um, you look at the, you know, the impacts of, to the rest of the cookie when you're trying to mine out that chocolate chip. You can see that, okay, well, did, did the cookies, you know, turn into crumbs um, or did it, uh, was it, was, was I able to move out the chocolate chips without uh, harming any of the rest of the cookie? Did I have to go a lot slower in order to do that? If I want to get the chocolate chips out faster, was there more damage uh, to the cookie? And so, this this is really um, a way of highlighting, you know, when we take something out of the earth, uh, it's very difficult to do that without having an impact on the uh, the world uh, around that area, uh, particularly when you think about the impact to plant and animal life. And our last one we're going to look at now is for grade eight, earth and space systems, and this is water systems, uh, and this is um, this is a great unit. Um, you know, so uh, 
in terms of the science, we're looking at you know water systems as it relates to local watersheds and um, water systems or water municipal water management facilities, um, and and really try to create the lens of sustainability and looking at uh, in particular the impacts of human activities on our water systems um, and and the factors that surround that. Uh, so whether that's talking again about uh, explicitly talking about climate change uh, via strand A, um, or if we look, you know, at, at you know what's happening in in our northern territories with melting of glaciers and um, uh, and and some of the the more pronounced effects of climate change happening in those areas, and and how is that impacting our global water system? Is that uh, what, what is the relationship to rising water levels and, and the melting in, in the north? Um, so in this activity uh, from TVO Learn, we've got grade eight students. Um, and in this case, uh, we're, we're bringing in again from that strand day, looking at uh, indigenous perspectives on the connection to water and the use of research skills to build an understanding of some of the issues impacting water, water quality uh, in the Great Lakes specifically. Um, so uh, again, back to TVO Learn, and we have again our, our minds on. Oh, pardon me, that's the wrong link. Let me just pause the recording for a second. Okay, here we go. So again, all the same sections still here, very consistent. Kind of a neat view. You can get a view of the Great Lakes from outer space uh, through this video. So this is our minds on. Um, here we can get students to, um, let's check out this activity for a second, uh, kind of pose some different questions. Uh, and again, like the whole minds on idea is, is really, um, we're, we're giving students a little bit of food for thought, but we're also trying to, to get at what they might already know. Um, and whether that's through, uh, you know, their lived experience in, in a different community from, from someone else in the classroom, or whether that is um, uh, something they've they've you know they've learned about through their own interest and and have some knowledge of already. And then when we get to the action part. This is a really kind of um, this is a really research driven um, activity, I guess. This this one in particular. Uh, really digs in though to to some of the um, uh, ongoing challenges that uh, people living in uh, across a range of different indigenous communities um, in Ontario um, have faced as a, a, a number of issues that they faced as as a community um, as it relates to the health of our water. It's good too. So here we're starting to um, frame, you know, frame student learning uh, in some different ways. So starting to build vocabulary, um, starting to in grade eight really think about where their information comes from and citing it and making sure that uh, the quality of the information they're researching is very high. Um, and then here we're starting some other research skills coming into play, like analyzing and interpreting findings, right? So I found some information on the internet. How do I make meaning from it? How do I make sense of it? How does it compare to other information that I've found? Um, and how valid is this information I've found? This is great too, thinking about bias and, and whose points of view are included in the information I've found uh, versus whose, whose points of view um, are not included and why are they not included? And then we get into this other phase of communicating, right? Um, who's my audience? Um, how will they best receive this information? What format makes the most sense? Um, and, and again, here we're creating drafts and reviewing. So these are all, you know, these are, these are critical research skills um, that are used in science, but not specific to only science. Uh, here's an action phase. So, you know, what, what can we do to, um, better understand and make and make our relationship to water more healthy. And then this idea of stewardship coming into focus. So what does it mean to be a steward of the water? Um, and what does that mean in, in an Ontario context? Okay.
So that's it for me today. I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, come on out and um, and uh, explore the new Ontario curriculum with me today. Uh, it's been an honor to be part of this um, to be part of this conference, uh, and um, and uh, I look forward to uh, participating again in the future. So I hope everyone has a great day. Bye bye.